Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Facebook Live. Thank you once again for joining us this afternoon as we continue to do this monthly series where we explore what we can see in the evening sky in the upcoming month. We are so glad that you could join us once again this afternoon. Uh, my name is Amber. I'm the Public Science Events Manager here at the Bell Museum, and I'm happy to report that the Bell Museum starting next week will be open once again six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to 4. So we hope that you will join us and come visit us at the museum once again. Uh, as always, we are encouraging people to buy tickets in advance and you can do that online. Our special exhibit right now is Bugs, uh, bugs, out, sorry, bugs Outside the Box. And it is uh, an exhibit that features large, large exhibits that you can get up close and personal with. And we have lots of fun things going on outside in our learning landscape. So we hope that you'll join us very soon. As always on Facebook Live, we love to hear your questions. So as Thaddeus is leading us through the nighttime skies in the month of July, any questions that come up, please place those in the comments on Facebook and I will share those with Thaddeus so that he can answer them live. Thank you for joining us once again. I'm gonna turn things over to Thaddeus, our planetary educator. All right, hello everyone. Good afternoon or evening or morning whenever you're watching this hopefully live right now uh, here in the late afternoon. Uh, my name, as Amber said, thank you, Amber. My name is Thaddeus. I'm the planetarium educator here at the Bell Museum. Uh, and I'm very excited to help uh, share what's in our July sky, um, as well as some of our very late uh, June sky as well. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and sh uh, share my screen. I'm gonna be using a program called Stellarium. Uh, if you've tuned in for one of our uh, events before, you, you've seen this. Uh, you might know Stellarium is one of my favorite uh, programs actually out there. It is a very uh, versatile uh, piece of equipment, uh, of planetarium equipment, actually. Uh, and it is a great way to view the night sky. All right. Uh, so I've gone ahead and set us up. Uh, we should, hopefully you're seeing on our screens there. Um, well, just a few things, actually. We are looking at the sky from right here in the Twin Cities. Uh, the date and time, uh, hopefully visible near the top of the screen there, is showing us that it's uh, June 28th uh, at 4.13 in the morning. Um, so just a couple days from now in the early morning. Uh, I, I checked the weather um, and, and I'm showing this date for a couple reasons, uh, but I, I will just start by saying I did check the weather for this date and it actually looks like it, it might be clear, maybe, fingers crossed. Um, and that makes make, means that you can see some of the things we're seeing right here. Now, if you're viewing from inside the Twin Cities, the things that are labeled here are probably gonna be the easiest to see. Uh, Jupiter is visible uh, here. Oh, and I should say, we're looking to the south for so that, that giant floating S down there at the bottom of the screen uh, that you're familiar with in the night sky. But we're looking at uh, Jupiter here uh, near the constellation of Aquarius that's gonna be visible in the early morning, uh, as well as Saturn near the constellation of Capricorn. And in between the two of those magnified a little bit here is our moon as well. Um, so three very bright objects and a fourth a very bright glowing object, a little bit brighter than it will actually be when you see it. Uh, but here on the morning of the 28th, we also have the International Space Station. Um, so the 28th is one of our pass zones here uh, on uh, in the early morning uh, for the ISS. So we'll get it moving along there. Um, the ISS goes over our head on a regular basis. Um, so you've got a good chance to see it. Um, Amber actually has some links. Um, we're gonna post a link in the chat there for both how you can find the station yourself uh, from Spot the Station um, from NASA, as well as a list of upcoming ones uh, here in the first couple of weeks, uh, end of June and the first week of July. Now, as it turns out, all the uh, ISS passes we have in the next week are in the early morning. Sorry, NASA doesn't consult me on this. Um, but keep an eye on the website. You can also sign up for alerts too to watch uh, what's uh, when the next one is going to be happening. And uh, there's so many exciting things going on in the ISS. There's uh, two things I think I'll point out today. Um, the first is that um, there are 10 people on board the ISS, uh, which is just crazy. I checked this just for today earlier and saw there were 10 and I was like, wow, usually there we get like maybe six there. But over the past couple of years um, with incre increased launches from right here in the United States provided by SpaceX, um, we're getting astronauts up there more and more. Uh, and coming up in just a couple of days on June 25th, uh, if you tune into NASA live TV, you can actually catch the next spacewalk planned. Uh, there's a third in a series of spacewalks planned on the 25th to install new solar panels um, on the ISS. 
Uh, so you can watch, uh, it's gonna be Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Pesquet. Uh, Shane uh, Kimbrough is, I don't know, I'm not on a first name basis with him, but I'll call him Shane today. Uh, Shane is with NASA and uh, Thomas is actually with the ESA, the European Space Agency. But they're deploying new solar panels um, to help augment the existing solar panels and provide more power to the ISS. Uh, for those who've been uh, watching space for you know any any long while, you might know the ISS has been up there for quite a long time. In fact, it's been up there twenty years now, over twenty years, um, and it is its solar panels are getting a little degraded, uh, micrometeorite impacts, um, dust from from the upper atmosphere slowly wearing them down. Uh, so installing new solar panels is going to allow the station to bounce back um, to gain even more power to allow for more continued experiments. It's also going to be a chance to just test these new solar panels um, and to actually uh, help uh, test them in preparation for future uh, missions. This is actually preparation for the Artemis missions, uh, part of NASA's um, Back to the Moon uh, initiative. Uh, now, I, 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 if you were checking our time here, um, I actually went forward. Uh, so we went forward. We can see the ISS again. Um, but if we go all the way to the 30th, oops, make sure I get the right days here. Um, we've got the ISS, uh, or excuse me, July 2nd. We've got the ISS going above our heads again. Um, I'm going to have to find this one is going, my notes here is telling me it's going west. There we go. West, north, west, southwest, uh, and going to the northeast. Um, so I've got the ISS marked out again. The ISS is very easy to see in the evening sky, even if you're right here inside the cities with our light pollution. It's this bright point of light not quite as bright as you see it on the screen, but quite bright point of light uh, going above your heads for anywhere from three to six to seven minutes. Um, in fact, these this pass here on July 2nd, the morning of July 2nd, is supposed to be above our heads for six minutes. Um, so going from the west, northwest, um, over to the northeast. Um, so very easy to see. One final thing I'll mention about the ISS is that uh, as it passes through Hercules there, uh, is Stellarium, actually two things here. Stellarium gives us a lot of information about the ISS. You can see it in the upper uh, corner of the screen there. And one thing it notes is actually the radio frequencies. Uh, one thing I was just looking up, uh, lo really looking into more this past week is you can actually uh, listen to the ISS. Um, so if you're a ham radio, amateur radio operator, um, you can listen at 145 megahertz. Um, you can tune into the ISS channel. Um, of course, you want to make sure you're only receiving on that channel um, because if you transmit, it'll cause the thing to crash and that's not good. That is a joke. Um, but for more details on how to listen to the ISS and the, the technical details, uh, we got another link there. Um, Amber should be able to put, us, put it in the chat for us um, to help, uh, help if you want to do that. All right. I mentioned a few constellations here, so let's get to some of those. As the ISS goes above our heads, they're going all the way back uh, through Draco here. Um, actually, I'm going to set up our sky to view it in June. Uh, excuse me, July. We're in July here. And I'm going to go to about mid-July, um, about to the 18th or so. And I'm going to turn off some of our sub and actually just make sure the ISS doesn't appear for us right now. But I'm going to go to about mid-June, uh, July, mid-July here. Uh, and we're going to go to about, well, the sun sets about 9 o'clock, 9.30. So let's go to about... Yeah, 1030 or so, it's a good time. So we had to go later in the evening here, of course, during uh, the summer months to see the night sky uh, because of course, well, the sun sets so late. Um, happy solstice to everyone. Uh, I was just a couple of days ago um, as, we're, as we're doing this right now, just a couple of days ago. Now, as we view the night sky here, I've already pointed out a few constellations uh, and the constellations I'm gonna stick with um, today are Greek and Roman constellations. So one's, uh, codified about, about 4,000 years ago or so. Um, but the Greek and Roman constellations are not the only constellations in the sky. And actually, I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge that the Bell Museum itself, where I'm recording from right now, the Bell Museum, which I hope you come visit, the Bell Museum actually sits on the treaty and traditional land of the Dakota people, who, along with the Ojibwe people, are the indigenous peoples of this land, Minnesota Makoche, or Minnesota. And in recognition of this fact and to honor the Dakota people for their care and knowledge of this land, we waive general admission here at the, here at the museum uh, for Dakota and all indigenous people. And we also have resources available, put in the chat again, resources where you can learn more about the night sky from uh, the indigenous perspective, uh, in particular from native sky watchers with Dr. Annette Lee. And if you're curious about learning more about the history of colonization and, and why we have a university here built on Dakota land, 
Uh, there's a great website, treatiesmatter.org, um, as well as some information available uh, from the Minnesota Historical Society, um, where you can learn more about these indigenous histories uh, in the past and, and what's going on right now. Uh, Dakota and Ojibwe cultures are living cultures. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about that, I highly encourage you to check it out. Today, I will be sticking with the Greek and Roman constellations in recognition of the fact as well that the uh, indigenous culture stories are their, own to tell, are their own stories to tell, and it's their own heritage. And I don't really have the right perspective and background to tell them. Looking here at our mid-July sky, um, some, many of these, these stars have been seen by cultures all across the world. And if you're looking in the night sky, look for some of the brighter and most obvious stars to start with. In particular, we're here facing south. Now, if you're curious where south is, there are a couple ways to find it. You can look for the giant red floating letter that you always see there in the sky. Um, you can also look for where the sun set. Well, not where the sun set, because the sun set to the west. So you actually want to keep the west to your right. And if west is to your right, then you are facing directly south. And directly to the south, there is also a very bright star you can see. One very, very noticeable, very hard to miss, very nice distinctive color to it. Right here is the star Antares, or Alpha Scorpio, Scorpius, Scorpii. Uh, this is the brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius, the Scorpion. Now, Antares is a very bright red star, and you might be confused for a second looking at it. You might actually mistake it for the planet Mars. That's how it gets its name. Antares is from Latin, Greek, anti-Aries, uh, the opposite of Aries, the opposite of Mars, the rival of Aries, various, Aries, various translations there. Um, so ancient astronomers mistook it for Mars, and they, they named it appropriately. One way to tell the difference is that Antares here will not be twinkling, or will be twinkling. Um, so stars will twinkle in the night sky. Let's see if we can center on Antares there for a second. Um, so it'll twinkle there, and that's uh, light being broken up by our atmosphere. Looking at planets, though, we'll see that planetary light doesn't twinkle. So the light from planets is reflected light from the sun. And because the planets are right in our own backyard, uh, that light comes to us as a disk, a sort of solid shape there. And planets don't twinkle in the night, in the night sky. Now, uh, Scorpius here, great to look at. You may also, um, he's fairly low in the sky um, for us here at 45 North, but tracing down the bottom part of Scorpius, there is another grouping of stars you might be familiar with. Uh, if you ever watched that movie Moana, came out a few years ago, made a bit of a hit. Uh, here we also find the fish hook, so Mau or Maui's hook um, here in the sky. Right beside it, there's another grouping of stars uh, that's pretty easy to see, even again, right here from inside the city, it's got bright stars, seven bright stars making it up. There's a handle on the left, there's a lid on the top, there's a spout on the right, you can sing the song to yourselves, but this is indeed the teapot. Now, the teapot here, this is part of a larger constellation called Sagittarius, uh, who you might know as the Archer. Now, right in between Sagittarius and Scorpius is another area, in fact, right about here. Um, actually, so I can just mark it out. Um, ooh, it's not gonna come up today. Uh, right near the top, uh, coming out the top of, this, of this, the teapot, the spout of the teapot, we also have the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So in this general direction, uh, about well, tens of thousands of light years away, uh, is the center of our own galaxy, where we have a supermassive black hole. Now here, in fact, during the summer months, this is one of the best times of month to see the Milky Way. Um, we have the bright central core of it visible right here to the south. Now we only have a few hours throughout the night. You know, once we go late in the night here, we'll go to midnight. We see that the Milky Way is setting along to the Southwest. And then in a few hours, the sun will start to rise. But because we have this brighter central area, it makes it a little bit easier to see. If we continue looking along the sort of general direction here and looking in fact further to the Southeast and East, uh, we can see two more planets starting to rise. If we go to about 11 o'clock, both of them should be up here just above the horizon. We have Jupiter, the king of our planets. Uh, Jupiter is amazing to look at, incredible to look at, very easy to see. Binoculars can bring it into view, uh, especially binoculars with just 10 by 10 by 30s, 10 by 40s or so. 
You can pick out some of the Galilean moons, the bright spots of light we see here. If you watch it over several minutes, well, even minutes, but especially hours, um, you can actually see the locations of these moons change. So looking over the course of a night here, we're going very, very quickly here, we're just zooming through time, um, where the moons are in relation around Jupiter are changing, um, which is just incredible to see. Um, it's one of my favorite things to look for when I, uh, when I look at Jupiter. Ooh, Jupiter disappeared there. Of course, um, you can't forget Saturn over here, also known as the best planet in the solar system. Uh, moons are also visible along, around Saturn, especially Titan up here, um, its largest moon, um, a nice bright orange color coming from its very thick atmosphere. But of course, the thing you look for at Saturn is going to be, well, Saturn and its beautiful rings. Incredible to see. Um, best viewed, I will say, I will say best viewed with a telescope, um, but a small telescope, four inches or so across, will start to bring you this distinct ring system. Um, you, you get up larger apertures, six, eight, even larger diameter telescopes, um, the rings will just pop out and it will look just like you see it on your screen here. Saturn, Saturn through a telescope looks like a, like a pretty picture, but it's gonna be the real thing. And this summer, as things are starting to pick up again, as we're all getting vaccinated, I hope you're getting vaccinated. Um, it's a great feeling, trust me. Uh, we are going to hopefully be starting to have more and more star parties or at least events or chances to get outside with telescopes. Uh, in particular, I'll direct you to the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Uh, the Minnesota Astronomical Society, mnastro.org, um, is our local astronomy site. They're a fantastic resource for viewing the night sky. They've already started doing a few events, just slowly picking up here, a few events, limited in number, um, and keeping those safety precautions in mind, um, but a few events to look at the night sky and fingers crossed, we just, it keeps getting better and better. Now, as we've looked along here, we've actually found two more constellations. If you're looking for at Jupiter and Saturn, um, here we can see Aquarius and Capricornus. I mentioned them way back when at the beginning of the show. Um, these are two faint constellations they are a little bit harder to find. Um, by faint, I, I should say, by faint, I mean that the stars that make them up are generally dimmer. They have a few bright stars. Um, we see Alpha and uh, Beta Aquarii over here, um, Alpha Aquarii, or excuse me, Beta Capricornus over here, uh, and there's El Jedi, um, Alpha Capricornus. A couple bright ones stand out, but the other ones are, are dimmer and harder to see. Um, in fact, these two constellations are part of a set of constellations known uh, as the sea. Um, so there's a handful like Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces, uh, Serpens, as well, or Hydra, excuse me, um, that are all these sea water related constellations and are also all very faint. If you do want to track them down, um, there are some different things you should actually look for. Let's find that. Uh, oh, actually, before I should pause here, um, I love talking about the sky, but I want to pause and see, Amber, are there any questions that have come up so far? I haven't seen any direct questions, lots of questions about what's going on at the Bell Museum and so forth. Um, but I have, uh, there was one request to, um, to learn a little bit more about the Big Dipper if you have time. Yes, excellent. Let's actually, then let's jump right to that. Um, we'll come back to the south. Um, and then uh, we'll go, we'll head over the north one. We'll come back to the south here. Yes, the Big Dipper. You know, honestly, I probably should have just started with this, right? I mean, that's the thing. Most of us are very, it's, I, it's the first thing I learned in the night sky. I think most of us are very familiar with it. It's the first thing we learn. Um, and it's very easy to find. Now, I've been going along. I have these nice letters in the sky. Really helpful for finding our way around. But if you go outside and you're just kind of looking around and you don't have these red letters, uh, the Big Dipper is still easy to find. Seven bright stars that look like a big spoon. And this time of year here in going right into midsummer, um, it's standing almost straight up and down with the handle higher than the bucket. Um, so that might help you just as you're looking at the screen here to find it. Um, I'll give you another second if you wanna, if you wanna take another look for it. Seven bright stars, the handle's coming up, the bucket's going down. All right, I'll give it away. It's right over here. Well, it's part of Ursa Major, Ursa Major has popped up, but the Big Dipper itself, if we turn on our asterisms here, uh, the Big Dipper is this grouping over here. Um, so these, you know what? Ursa Major just keeps popping up there. 
Uh, so these seven stars, um, these seven stars are actually somewhat related to each other. They're part of a moving group of stars, the Ursa Major moving group. Um, so they're stars that were born in roughly the same time over the same few uh, million year time period in a cluster. Um, and they're gravitationally associated with each other. Now, over millions and billions of years, as they've gone around our galaxy, they've drifted apart. Um, and right now, to our eyes, it looks like a nice little spoon there. If you fast forward time through millions of years in the future, the stars will continue drifting. Our own sun will keep moving around the Milky Way. Um, and we actually won't see a dipper anymore. But it's really great because right now we do see a dipper and it helps us find things. Because as you go outside at night, if you take the two stars in the bucket of the Big Dipper, Mirac and Dobe, Dobe here, um, if you follow these two stars above the bucket of the Dipper, um, about mm, two hand lengths or so, if you go along, you can find one sort of lonely star, not super bright. You can see it from inside the city, um, but surrounded by a whole lot of, not a lot of stuff. This star right here, known as Polaris or our North Star. Very special star. If we set time moving forward again, I'll just get it moving here. And we look at the sky move around. Well, we see that it does move. The Big Dipper in particular, it went from straight up and down to as we go here to just before sunrise, 4.30. It's now close to the horizon and it's nice and flat there like a, like a spoon should be. But throughout all of this, Polaris has stayed in the same spot. So our North Star gets its name very simply because it's a star and it's to the North all the time. All throughout the night, throughout the year, throughout our lifetimes, Polaris will be right there. It is our guide star. So whenever you go outside at night, look for the Big Dipper first, really. It, just what you should do. Because once you can find it, you can find North. And then you know right behind you South and you know where East and West are to your left and right, respectively. And then you can really find your way around the whole, the whole sky here. And since we're looking here, you know, it popped up, but you may also see that we also have our little dipper here, um, this smaller grouping, um, which is Ursa Minor, the smaller bear. Um, so Ursa Major over here, which the Big Dipper is a part of, and then Ursa Minor, larger and smaller bears. Bears with very long tails. If you wanna find out more about that, you can stop by the planetarium and ask us in person. We'll be happy to tell you why that happens or how they got their long tails and stuck in the sky. Now, as we look here, um, we're gonna go to the south, we're actually doing it in a sort of meandering way here. Since, you know, we found the Big and Little Dipper, we can use them. If you look in between the Big and Little Dipper, and I do wanna mention, I, I took us back here to, uh, to 10.30, so we're here in the early evening again. Uh, and if you look in between the Big and Little Dipper, the, there's sort of a curving line of stars. I'm actually gonna see if I can draw on my zoom screen here. There we go. There's this sort of curving line of stars. It comes around and then, and then I, then I can't move things once I do that. So, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll stop that annotation there. Um, this curving line of stars that comes around, you can imagine where it was in between the big and little dipper and then down again, and then it takes another curve around. It comes back to another couple bright stars, I've drawn some lines there. This is the constellation of Draco or the dragon. So right in between the Big and Little Dipper. Now Draco, kind of like Aquarius and Capricornus, is a fainter constellation. It doesn't have a lot of very bright stars. The few of them, there are a few ones that are easier to see, like the one I clicked on here, and to land. And I'm not going to try to pronounce that name. Uh, Rasman, though, at the head, um, down, coming down, we have Altis, and then also... Uh, where is, ooh, I've got to, oh, make sure I get the right one there. I ah, okay, can't find Thuban there. Oh, there's Thuban, right, in between the, at the end of the, the Little Dipper. Oh, and Alpha Draconis Thuban over there. Um, a few of these stars stand out a little bit more. Now, as we look here, we found Draco. Um, let's see. Well, if you found the head of Draco, so right here, head of Draco. So that's pretty easy to find. A couple stars, kind of a quartet of stars, four stars. Mm -hmm. And if you just look a little bit off it, hey, look, there's another bright star, the star Vega. Now, Vega right here, this is a star that's a little bit easier to see from the south. So I'm going to swing us. I'm actually going to pull us back to a, a wider view of the sky. And I'm going to come back, actually, i um, going to go to about the east here. Excuse me, not the south, the east. So in the early evening, looking to the east. 
Um, so we still have Draco up over here. So it's high above our heads. Coming down from it, looking more to the east, we find again Vega there. Now Vega is part of the small constellation of Lyra or the harp. Um, a handheld harp, the one carried by Orpheus um, in Greek mythology. And looking at Lyra and Vega, we can keep star hopping along here. If you come just a little bit downwards to the north, so back where the Polaris is, in that direction, we can find the star Deneb. Deneb right here is part of the constellation of Cygnus, the swan or the goose. Now, Cygnus here is one of my absolute favorite constellations to find in the summer sky. Because once you find Cygnus, you can actually find that thing that I mentioned way back when. You can find the Milky Way. Because Cygnus here, if you look at these lines, if you can, and these stars are very bright, they're very easy to see. But if you can take these lines and you draw a line all the way along here, well, this goes right along the path of the Milky Way. So trying to, so trying to find the Milky Way can, can sometimes be hard. Start with Cygnus and it'll guide you right to it. All right, so we had Vega, we had Deneb. Finally, if we come down or uh, we can find a little bit further down from Vega, down to the uh, southeast or so, we can find a very bright star called Altair. Altair is part of Aquila or the Eagle. Um, now these three stars right here, uh, sorry, check our time here. Uh, these three stars right here, uh, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, uh, these make up a large grouping known as the Summer Triangle. Now you can, as we did, you can go from the Big Dipper to Little Dipper to Draco to Vega and downwards, or you can look out in the night sky and you can look sort of south, um, more to the, towards the east in the early evening, and you can see the Summer Triangle very easily there. These three stars, Vega, Altair, and Deneb are three of the brightest stars in the sky. Vega here actually is the fifth brightest star in the entire sky, starred in that movie Contact a while back. Um, is a very important star in astronomy for other reasons, not the movie reasons. Um, and so from right here inside the city, these are so easy to see. Now, once you find the Summer Triangle and you find these three constellations, there's actually a few more you can find as well. Um, looking back um, towards Vega here, um, we can see a few bright stars. Let me, actually, I, mean, I need to reorient myself one more time here. We are looking south. All right, there we are. We found Scorpius a little bit earlier. Always good to recenter yourself here. We've got Scorpius right here. Um, and then, and there's a head of Draco there. So two bright stars there. Oh, there's our moon down there. So that's looking over to the southwest. What did we find? We found the Big Dipper arching way back over there. And right, oh, you know what? Let me go back to the Big Dipper for a second. That I'll, If you take the handle of the Big Dipper, so not the bucket, but the handle, and you arc down from it, you curve down from it, you'll find the star Bootes, or excuse me, you'll find the star Arcturus, which is part of the constellation of Bootes, uh, the herdsman or the farmer. Um, all right, so we've got Arcturus there. And uh, ooh, now I've got to bring up all those other things that I just, oh, no, we didn't find that one. Um, we will in a second though, bring up some of these other things though that I had earlier. Um, what I just clicked on the bright star there, I thought I was clicking on tear, but this is uh, Razal Ghul. This is part of the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, um, carrying the constellation of serpents on either side of him. And then what I was really looking for here, um, in between Vega and Arcturus, we have a small grouping of stars, a small grouping of stars, four stars in a shape known as the Keystone. And this is the Keystone of the constellation of Hercules. Let's get Hercules up there. There's Hercules. Uh, so the constellation of Hercules, uh, the hero in Greek mythology, one of the many heroes in Greek mythology. Um, now, I find the keystone a little bit harder to find sometimes in the sky. Um, it's still, you can still see it from inside the city, but in particular, finding Vega over here and finding Arcturus down here in Lyra and Bootes, um, right in between the two of them, that's where you get the keystone. So that can be an easier way to narrow it down. You can also, since we're here, you can also look for a bright star known as Alfica in Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. That, that is also very easy to see as well. 
But finding Hercules brings me to something else. Um, as we, as, uh, as I look through my notes here at all the things I haven't been able to get to yet, um, but there's one really beautiful thing that I do want to point out. The reason we find all these constellations is not just to look for shapes in the sky, it's also to find other fainter things as well. In particular, on one side of the keystone of Hercules, this, uh, as I look at it and see it, I call it the right side of it. Um, there's an object you can see in the summer sky that is absolutely stunning. In fact, you can see it with your naked eye. Um, looking with your naked eye, in fact, it looks like a tiny little fuzzy patch. In fact, if I zoom in just a tiny bit, right near the center of the screen, a little fuzzy point. There's something you could see with your naked eye under very dark skies, far away from any city light pollution, the Boundary Waters or Voyagers National Park, if you get up there, um, that's what you'd see. Now, if you took a pair of binoculars or a telescope, you could start to see a little bit more. In fact, you could see M13, Messier 13, the great globular cluster in Hercules. Um, so this object, what we just see right here, is actually a collection of about 300,000 stars. It's located outside our Milky Way galaxy, about 25,000 light years away, but it's orbiting around it. It's part of our larger Milky Way uh, neighborhood. And the stars in this globular cluster, we've been able to date them, they're about 11 and a half billion years old. So they form shortly after the beginning of the universe, uh, beginning of the universe which is 14 billion years old, or 13.85. Um, and globular clusters like uh, M13 are incredibly important for understanding the history of the universe, how stars uh, form and change and then die, and also understanding how galaxies form as well. In fact, some of the latest research now suggests that globular clusters used to be part of galaxies themselves. They were star clusters born within galaxies, and they were ejected outwards as galaxies underwent collisions over the course of billions of years, um, evidence that we've seen in our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's not the only globular cluster I, I, I want to mention. There are many globular clusters uh, similar to uh, the great star cluster in Hercules, as it's noted there. Uh, Stellarium actually marks them out as this little circle with a cross in it. Um, for example, higher up, uh, also near Hercules, we have Messier 92, um, looking in some ways similar, but also a little bit different. We can see as we look at globular clusters, ones that have denser cores or um, ones that have a shell of new stars or uh, other stars around the outer edges of the of that puff ball that we see there. Um, looking as well, if we come back to um, Arcturus over here, another uh, favorite M3 here. These are all Messier objects named after Charles Messier. Um, and these images, I should mention here, these are coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. So please don't expect to see them quite like this. Um, but they do come into view very, very easily in the uh, in the sky. Again, binoculars or a telescope as well are a great way to see them. All right. Um, keep an eye on our time, Amber. I know we are always running out of time. We're running through time very quickly. I want to pause again, see if any questions popped up along the way. Uh, I believe when you were showing us Cygnus, there, there was that age-old question in Minnesota as to whether or not it was a goose or a gray duck. Um, and then also a request to be maybe learn a little bit more about what's happening with the moon in the month of July. Yes, um, uh, I will say it's a duck, first of all. Um, not a Minnesota native, so you can write your angry comments there on Facebook. Um, that's what Facebook's for, right? Um, yes, let me see what I've got for my notes here about the moon. It's, oh, I love looking at the moon. I was looking at the moon. Um, I've actually been looking at it for the last couple of weeks. It's been beautiful to see going from the new moon to crescent to full. Um, it's a beautiful sight. Now we're here. Um, our time is, uh, we're here on July 16th, uh, about, uh, 20, quarter to 11 here. Um, where's the moon? Well, it's over here in Virgo. So here on the 16th, it's right nearby the star Spica were well worth looking at. And we're here just about at first, or maybe almost exactly at first quarter. This is a great time to see the moon. Um, it's not too bright. So it's not gonna like blind your eyes if you look at it closely with binoculars um, or a telescope. But there's still a lot of detail you can start to see. The maria along the sides of darker patches, the craters all across the surface. Um, with a large enough telescope, enough magnification, a camera, if you get into astrophotography, the moon is a great place to start. Um, 
You see some beautiful newer craters here with the beautiful rays coming out as well. All right. Now, um, Ooh, and you know what, let me actually head backwards in time. Um, so we're here at first quarter. Um, as we go forward into the month, at the same time of night, the moon will be getting larger and larger. And as it rises, it'll be further and further to the east. Um, and we'll come here, in fact, all the way to, um, let's see if I got my day right there. Oh, we're about a day past first quarter. Um, hold on, I lost the moon. There we go, Stellar, it's gotta be great. You can just type in moon and there you go. Um, so we go all the way to the full moon here. A uh, little too bright, a little too hard to look at. Um, beautiful to see, um, but I don't really recommend looking at it with, um, with binoculars or a telescope because it just sort of overwhelms your eyes. You go basically blind for a few minutes, um, kind of unpleasant. As you go later in the month, as we go towards the end of July, well, the moon's actually disappeared, right? Well, no, it's not disappeared. It's visible later and later in the night because now it starts waning. So it starts getting smaller and smaller, always still further and further to the east until we start to reach the end of the month where we see our last quarter moon. Um, another great time to see it as well. Um, looking here on the opposite side that we saw lit up before, giant Maria visible now, Oceanus Proclarium. Um, these massive impact basins, uh, the Mari are, are where asteroids smashed into the moon billions of years ago. Um, but I'm going to go, believe it or not, backwards in time to July 4th. Um, July 4th, um, at the correct time, 4.30, we are near, again, the last crescent moon. Um, we'll come over here. Um, so we're a little past last quarter, and we're starting this last crescent, so less and less of it visible. Um, but July 4th is a great time to go out and look for the moon um, because it's going to be, in fact, oh, was it July 4th? Um, well, it's Independence Day, July 4th, so it's easier day to remember. Um, but if we go just a little bit sort of in the, in between July 5th and July 6th, um, if you're looking with binoculars, you might actually be able to catch both the moon and the Pleiades in the same field of view. Um, so the Pleiades visible over here, just a little bit over, um, further to the east. Um, so that's going to be a cool sight, seeing both these in the same field of view. Binoculars are going to be the best, really almost, I'd say the only way to do that, um, except for your unaided eye. Um, we've also got as well here, and apologize, I know now why I came to July 4th. I had a different note here. Um, this is also one of the best times of the month in July here to see Mercury. So if you want to see Mercury in the very early uh, morning, um, that's July 4th is going to be one of those best days, right around 4.30. Um, a tiny little point of light uh, down to the, very close to the horizon, to the east-northeast. Um, it's going to be hard to see. I won't, I won't lie to you about that. Um, but if you, it might be easier if you start off by finding an, uh, Aldebaran, which is the eye of Taurus or the bull. It should be visible um, in even even with the early uh, early morning, uh, the the sun rising here in the early morning, uh, the the dawn light, and coming down from and uh, Aldebaran, coming about a hand uh, fist length down, about ten degrees down, um, Mercury should become visible there. Um, jumping back again, jumping through all my notes here. Apologize. Uh, coming to in fact the end of the month again, um, I, let's see if we can find our moon. The moon is gonna be near last um, quarter here. You know what, we're just gonna do moon. And there we go, perfect. Um, well, actually, not near last quarter, we're not quite there yet. Um, we're just at this waning gibbous phase for the moon here at the end of July. Now, that's gonna be nice to see, still pretty bright. One problem is that it's gonna interfere with one thing happening. Right near the end of July, um, right near the 20th and 29th is the peak of the Southern Delta Aquarius, um, a meteor shower. Um, so the waning gibbous moon is, it's the light of that moon is going to interfere with seeing the Delta Aquarius, at least over the few days around the end of the month. If you do start looking all the way into, the, into August, early August, um, here in the early morning, maybe even 3.30, 2.30, late, late night, um, this might be a good chance as well to see some of the Aquarius, the Southern Delta Aquarius. 
Um, meteor showers don't just happen over the course of one night or one day. They're week-long affairs. Um, so you wanna get out whenever you can really. And again, later all the way into August, um, it'll be a little bit easier to see them without the light of the moon there. All right, Amber, I don't, I, maybe I should have asked actually, was there a specific question about the moon? Um, we, was covering a little bit of what we can see throughout the month there. Um, yeah, I think I think you answered that. There was just a request to to learn a little bit more about the moon, and and a question came in a little bit later about uh, the strawberry moon and whether or not uh, that would be happening in the next couple of days. Um, that is a good question. I'm actually not sure. I'm gonna have to look that one up. Um, the strawberry moon. I'm assuming that was going to be the full moon in July. Um, just going off the name, we give. Um, Different names have been given to different months, uh, excuse me, to different full moons throughout the year. Um, and we are here, we are in June. We are, um, the full moon is going to be Thursday. So that's actually just tomorrow night. Um, and my guess would be if that is then, and again, I, I, I want to, we're going to have to double check all these things just to be sure, could be wrong. Um, if the strawberry moon is referring to the full moon in June here, excuse me, June, not July, June, um, that will be tomorrow night then. It'll be near the teapot in Sagittarius. Um, I'm gonna hazard a guess and say that this is probably the time of month to pick strawberries. Does that sound right to you, Amber? Are you a strawberry fan? <laughs> I love I eating am. them. <laughs> I am a strawberry fan. I don't know that I've ever actually picked them myself though. I picked them growing up way back in the day when I was, about as tall as the strawberry plants. Um, I remember picking them. I haven't done that in years, um, but I'm gonna guess that maybe this is the time of year when they start getting ripe and you wanna start picking them. So this is gonna be a delicious thing for me to find out more about here as we go along. Well, thank you. Thank you for hazarding a guess on that. It'll give us an opportunity to all explore that a little bit more and see um, and see if that's if that's something that's coming up in the nighttime sky. Um, someone did just comment that, yes, they were picking strawberries yesterday. So you have your timing right on that. <laughs> OK, excellent. And hopefully they picked it. It was slightly cooler. Uh, I was out of town the past few days, but I think it was slightly cooler down here the past few days. So hopefully. Hopefully some of that stays with us as you go out strawberry picking. Um, remember to drink lots of water, um, whatever you're doing out there, drink lots of water and stay hydrated. Um, all right, I'm just going through, um, I wanna be mindful of our time, Amber, but I, I just wanted to put up a lot more constellations everywhere we look across the sky, any of these brighter stars we can see, these are gonna be some different constellations and some dimmer stars as well. Um, finding the bright ones like we did from the Big Dipper to the Summer Triangle. These will help you find all of these fainter constellations. It will also help you find some of those different deep sky objects as well um, that are visible throughout the night. Uh, Messier 13, the globular cluster in Hercules is just one of them. Stellarium shows us a whole bunch more than we could ever see in a night. Um, as I guess I'll just note here for the final thing I'll say is that if you are going out looking for the Milky Way, you have a pair of binoculars all along the path of the Milky Way, uh, right here to the south is a perfect place to see a variety of different, totally different objects um, from star clusters to nebulas to a few globulars speckled here and there. Um, there's so much to see just in that one little area near the center of the, near the center of our galaxy. All right. With that, I think we've reached the end of our time. Amber, last check for questions though, just to just to triple check. I hate leaving anyone. Yeah, no, I just I just checked one more time. One of our wonderful Facebook friends did post a link from NASA about the strawberry moon. So that's an opportunity for all of us to go check Excellent. and learn a little bit more um, about the what the strawberry moon is all about. So, I want to thank once again, everyone for joining us. Uh, we do this once a month where we can explore what's coming up in the nighttime sky. Uh, we hope that you, it, it is obviously a lot light, a lot later. Um, so you have to be able to stay up a little bit later, but hopefully you'll get out in these wonderful summer months and enjoy some nighttime sky viewing a little bit later in the evening. Uh, once again, I did want to let you know that the Bell Museum starting next week is going to be open six days a week, once again, from Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we hope to be able to see you at the museum very soon. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. Uh, if we don't see you at the museum, we'll see you next month as we continue to look at Minnesota night skies. Thank you, Thaddeus. All right, you're very welcome. Stay safe, everyone, and I hope you get out and get a chance to see the night sky.